Great. Great. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And i um, really happy to be on with Sanjeev again. Uh, we met about a year ago when I was organizing a uh, Data Lake open source panel at Subsurface, which is actually coming up again. You should go check it out. Um, and Sanjeev was moderating it. It was, it was a very fascinating panel. And um, what uh, we wanted to do is it was, just thought it'd be a good idea to get back together and, and talk about what's changed over the past year and, and bring up some of these topics again that we talked about last year, um, only with uh, a more recent update. And by way of background, I'll just share that I was around when the term big data was first making the rounds. I was really heavily involved in cloud computing, the early days of cloud computing back then. And it seemed like the cloud was changing everything in IT and every major technology uh, throughout the IT industry was, was being impacted. And it wasn't just like ripples from the cloud, it was big crashing waves. And so we had a, a big data camp, which is an unconference where we discussed what you know big data meant. And we were trying to grapple with the fact that now everyone could have access to tools, open source tools to, to manage big data like Hadoop and these kind of things. Um, and so we were trying to understand what was coming, you know, what, what op opportunities were there, what advantages could we take with this new technology and what, what should we be expecting to see? And back then questions were like, um, you know, how do we deal with distributed data? Because there's so much data we can't store them on one server or one hard drive or whatever we were putting our data on. And so, you know, how do we deal with things like the cat, you know, Eric Brewer's cap theorem, where you could only have uh, two out of the following three items. You could have consistency, availability, uh, and or partition tolerance, but you couldn't have all three, right? And it feels like over the past 10 years, we've been grappling with that and trying to solve that problem. And, and even though there is no perfect solution, there's been many technologies that have come along and have given us the ability to, to live within those constraints with maybe two and a half of those issues instead of only two that we could um, uh, take care of. So, but now what's happening, I'm noticing is that, that instead of, that, like the changes are still coming, but instead of them being punctuated in these big, you know, thunderous changes that, that come out, seem to come out of nowhere or come out as really fast, it's still coming out as fast, but instead of like a big crashing wave, it's more like a, uh, like a long tsunami wave where, you know, you, you don't really notice right away that the change is happening, but before you know it, uh, you know, you're up to your neck and, and there's, there's so much happening that, that you didn't see coming because it happened so slowly or it seemed to be happening so slowly, even though there's the so much way of water coming. So we thought we'd take this opportunity to, to talk about, okay, what are some of those big mega trends that have been coming at us for the past couple of years? And, and you know, where are we at? And what's, what's the big news today that's changing? Um, and so, you know, again, I'm happy to have San, Sanjeev with us. And I'll start off by just sharing with, you know, one of the trends that I've noticed is that we've seen companies storing large amounts of database data, not, not just unstructured data, but putting massive amounts of data into an object store and then treating that data as if it was database data, like they're actually querying it in real time, you know, it, with SQL queries. So, you know, that to me seems like one change that um, has, has been occurring recently. Uh, but but Sanjeev, what, why don't you tell us, what do you think like is this, what are the big changes and, and, and what is this new modern data stack? What does it mean? Yeah, so uh, thank you Dave for setting this up. Uh, the, the, you, you really said it very well, how, you know, there's this trickle of change that's coming. Uh, in fact, I didn't think of it that way. For me, it's like everything seemed like a mega trend. Every day there's something new going on. Uh, even between meetings, if I go to LinkedIn, just right now today, I see, oh, DBT Labs got Series D of 220 million, something like that. They're now $4 billion valuation. So to me, it's like there's just so much happening. But now that you've 
post it that way, I, I think this is like death by a thousand cuts. The complexity is so high these days. We see that this whole data and analytics space is disaggregating and specialization is happening so rapidly that we are having to deal with so many different moving parts. So you ask like, what is a modern data stack? Modern data stack is, is one way for us to consolidate into fewer, piece, uh, fewer independent pieces that are some, somehow pre-integrated and they've been proven to work together. For example, since I mentioned DBT, so I'll, I'll use them as an example. If I'm building an analytical architecture, I can use maybe Fivetran with HPR for doing data ingestion, DBT to do data transformation, land my data into Snowflake, and then use my BI uh, reporting tool of choice or SQL and, and do my reports. So this is an example of a modern data stack. It does not reduce the number of moving parts, but it at least brings together some of the technologies in some sort of like an accelerated fashion. So you can then uh, have to think less about integration of these technologies. So that is modern data stack, but customers, they want flexibility, they want, to innovate. So, so modern data stack is one way of handling this. At the same time, it does not stop the growth of, uh, of specialized technologies. So, you know, in the, in, in the early days, we would talk about stacks as being like the lamp stack or the mean stack, you know, it was, it was right. like a very concise set of software right. uh, that you would combine together and you could probably like deploy it quickly on your laptop or something and, and right. run it or uh, but it sounds to me like what you're talking about with this modern data stack is that it's it, it, there's so much involved that it, it, it's not just one piece of software it's mm -hmm. it's 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 not even one process it's like multiple processes and multiple pieces of software coming together to handle the the challenge Correct. Yeah. Yes. So, like for, for example, uh, Dave, uh, I talked about these few companies, but a modern data stack could have even a reverse ETL component. It could have data observation. It could have a data catalog. So that's the difference between like an Elk stack, which was Elastic, Logstash, Kibana. This is uh, the scope is much wider here. Right, right. And so it's like the stack is almost like conceptual parts and you can fill it in with the the vendor best of breed that fits your use case and so so you end up with like all of these building blocks when it's and it's really up to you to to piece this together so like what are the the building blocks of a, a modern data architect yeah. So that's a great question. So the way, uh, so I think when I have done my architecture diagram uh, in the past, I break it down into five different pieces. So the five pieces, the first one would be ingestion and integration. And we talked about actually some of the companies like Fivetran, for example, Stream is another one, a lot of emphasis on streaming data, for instance. So that's ingestion and integration. Then comes the whole storage. Storage is, is a, a hugely uh, controversial, uh, always in the news, because this is how we store data. We have sort of come to an acceptance that modern technologies uh, are being built on top of object stores. Object stores give us super high durability, they are cheap, and, uh, and they have all of the disaggregation of compute and store like Amazon S3. But what sits on top of storage? Is it a cloud data warehouse or is it a data lake house? That is something which is still in uh, in lot of debate. So that's the building block number two. So we talk about ingestion and integration, landing it into storage. The third building block is analytics. When I talk about analytics, I'm talking about all kinds of analytics. It may be traditional analytics where we used to build reports and dashboards, and we still do, 
or it could be analytics that are more advanced data science like analytics, but it also includes um, what's a semantic layer, a knowledge graph, uh, data virtualization layer, analytics engines, like you mentioned, Dremio or Starburst with Trino, Presto. So all that comes under analytics piece. So these are the three building blocks uh, that are distinct. Now underneath are horizontal building blocks and there are two of them. One is governance and the other one is operations. Governance is all the metadata related things that we do to catalog the data, curate the data, make sure that we are doing proper data access governance. So people are only people only see data they're authorized to see, making sure we meet our data privacy compliance regulations like GDPR or CCPA. So that's governance. And the fifth layer is operations. That is primarily data ops, but it's not just data ops. Data ops is data uh, DevOps for data it could be MLOps, you know, like feature engineering. So that is how do I automate and reuse the pieces that I'm building for my analytics architecture all the way from ingesting the data to consuming data. So those are the five building blocks that uh, that I see that are critical. What just, you... just to throw a, another question in here is, um, you know, this is, we're talking all about this, the database and the data and moving all that data around, you know, these five elements. Um, and is this mostly happening in the public cloud or is this mm -hmm. happening on prem or is it a little bit of both? Where do, yes. you, where do you see that happening? Very good question. In fact, um, I, I think this is a question that needs a lot of careful attention. Is this all in the cloud or is this on-prem? Because we we keep thinking that, oh, everything uh, is happening in the cloud. Cloud is it. Everybody's talking about cloud. I want to point you to something that Andy Jassy talked about last year in April, but while he was still with uh, AWS and hadn't yet moved to Amazon.com. Andy Jassy said, only 5% of global IT spending is in the cloud. Only 5%. Now, even if he's let's say a little bit off, uh, it's no more than 20%. So what, what does that mean? 80% of the work is still going on on premises. So this, this uh, componentization of or the building blocks that I talked about, it's not necessarily uh, in the cloud. We as seeing that on-premises is starting to now bring a lot of this platform as a service capabilities onto on-prem. So even on-prem, I don't need to necessarily have very expensive file system. I can have an open source object store like MinIO or Red Hat Ceph or um, Apache Ozone, and I can build on top of that. So, so we are seeing that there's a transfer of, of advancements from the cloud. And I have to say cloud is where these all started onto on-prem. And a follow-up on that in that is that, okay, so we're talking primarily about all of these changes uh, yeah. that are happening with the data. And you mentioned that uh, data ops is sort of like uh, DevOps for data. And it seems to me that there, these, these are almost like completely two separate tracks that are going on where application deployment is happening in its own space yes. and uh, the data uh, is more complicated. So it's been evolving at a, at a different pace, like a, almost like a separate wave coming. So, so it's, uh, you've just uh, raised one of my pet peeves. I, I really feel that <laughs> I'm a data guy and I feel that data people, and this is for the first time I'm saying this in public, I feel data people have had a lack of empathy for business. We lived in our own sort of domain. So we, we've been late at adopting DevOps. We've been late at adopting data as a product while software did. We've been late at adopting uh, you know, data, um, 
uh, not just uh, DevOps and data as a product, but uh, data monitoring. So data observability. Uh, so, so now I feel that the data world is moving rapidly fast to catch up and be part of the bigger ecosystem, which includes applications. So applications, how did we build applications in the past in the data world? When I started my career, I was writing SQL statements. Then I was in Oracle when Oracle introduced PL SQL, uh, which was a procedural language, and, and thereby we got stored procedures. Now we were writing uh, logic, business logic and stored procedures. But what we're seeing today is that people are saying, no, 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 I want to write my, my logic in whatever language I want. And I don't necessarily need to tightly couple it with my database architecture. What if I wrote it, uh, my application at a higher level in Python, in Ruby, in Java, in Scala, and then I pushed it down into the database. So the database is still an excellent execution engine, but we, we have sort of dis, uh, decoupled our application development. So, so what, what we are seeing is actually very interesting. Uh, because of data gravity, first we brought compute close to data. So we could push down Spark, we could do uh, execution of data, uh, uh, execution of logic where the data resides, even push down machine learning training right into the database. Now we are seeing even the applications are being pushed down. Uh, for example, there's a, uh, there's a new thing starting, uh, actually it's not new, but only now it's starting to get traction is WebAssembly or WASM. WASM allows you to, to bring your applications and your compute close to data. That's right. Uh, it's funny you mentioned data gravity. That was a, a term that I think was um, either coined or uh, defined by uh, Dave McCory, which was also one of those big data camp people from the past, <laughs> from my past. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I've noticed a similar trend when when big changes are occurring, they they usually happen in the simplest uh, area first. And deploying applications is simpler than deploying, you know, and updating data. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of makes sense that that would happen in that way. But yeah, uh, you're right. You know, the um, yeah. maybe that maybe the data folks didn't think that that was going to apply to them uh, as soon as it is is now. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, I, I'm so glad you brought that up because I I forgot. Uh, I I'm so uh, it's good you mentioned that to to the defense of data people which is myself at least, and I guess you, you know, even though now uh, you do a lot of infrastructure and operations pieces, but you know, applications don't change all the time, but data does. We have a concept of data gravity. We don't have a concept of application gravity. So, <laughs> so therefore it takes time for data to really rise up to the same level as applications, because once you write an application, of course you can, you know, uh, have keep having microservices change every day. Netflix pushes ten thousand changes, but but data is changing literally every micro mini millisecond, and you need to handle data much more differently than you handle uh, applications. That's right. So, uh, which brings us to our next point, which is yeah. okay. So, if the data ops folks want to be more agile, if the company wants to be more agile. Now, how do yeah. they take these modern data building blocks uh, and put them together to help people become companies become more agile? So there are a few things that uh, come to my mind. One is uh, I've talked about data ops, and it's not like I'm pushing for data ops uh, on this call, but but data ops gives you a more structured way of building your pipeline so you can reuse. Uh, you know, using some of the low code, no code techniques, you know, uh, it allows us to bring more of citizen roles. Like if we have the right tools, then having citizen analysts, citizen integrators, they can drag and drop, they can, you know, build their self-service uh, applications. Automation is really important. Uh, and then in the cloud, I, I think one way how we've managed to become very agile is 
a lot of data technologies are finally becoming uh, software as a service. Uh, I know, you know, Snowflake introduced SaaS and that was a, such a big deal is when Snowflake suddenly came into the scene, it was like, wow, I don't have to tune my database. I don't have to manage it. It's self-tuning, self-healing, uh, no indexes to be created. That was a, a surprise. I feel that now the data providers are taking it to the next level, which is serverless, where the entire data is abstracted into literally an API call. So, uh, so not only the cloud introduced fully managed, uh, but I still had to do some, I had to figure out uh, what instance type do I need to pick up and how big my, my cluster should be. Even that is starting to now get abstracted through serverless. Got it. Um, so Beyond serverless, though, you mentioned a lot of other technologies, you know, in the data ops space. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, like, for example, we, we saw this change from uh, ETL to now ELT. Correct. So how is for how is that, for example, helping a company become more agile? Yes, uh, good point. So. So if you see, why did we go from ETL to ELT? So extracting something from, let's say, SAP, HANA, or Teradata does not change. That becomes like a commodity. Loading it into an Oracle Autonomous Data Warehouse or Redshift or BigQuery also does not change. So what, uh, what uh, the revelation was that if the extract and the load are static, but transformation really depends upon how you want to write your business logic. So transformation is very specific to your organization, your use case, your business requirements. So ELT says, let's, uh, let's package extract and load because that's commodity and buy that from a third party. And then let's uh, do transformation separately because transformation, now I can, uh, maybe I wanna write my uh, transformation in PySpark, for instance. You know, I can, I can do whatever language I want, whatever underlying storage I want. So, so you see, this is how we broke apart uh, and instead of having transformation sit in between, we move transformation after extract and load. Also, loading became easier. Uh, see, the problem that we used to have way back when we had these traditional data warehouses like Teradata and Netiza, storage was very expensive. So we had to transform the data before we stored it. We aggregated that data. Now, cloud storage is cheap and almost infinite. So why don't we extract and load the data in its raw form, then we transform it. Now I can also handle multiple use cases. Tomorrow if somebody says, oh, by the way, I have a new use case. I want to do predictive maintenance on my equipment. I have the raw data because I loaded it as, it, I, as I extracted it. I can transform it for a new use case. Got it. Going back to one of my favorite use cases or storage is the object store again. And I, sure. you just reminded me that when folks are doing the extract um, and load, they can extract it from wherever and load it to the object store. And that can, like you said, be a, a component they can buy or, or open source tool. Um, sure. But then once it gets to the object store, there's so many different applications or, or databases that need to access that data. And right. that is where you do the transformation so that you can actually transform that data, uh, not to make it smaller necessarily, but to make it in the right format for all of those different tools that might access that, that data on the object store. Like, you know, whether they need it in CSV file format or uh, Parquet or, or whatever that is. So yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Um, so then, what, what, what are you seeing as far as trends in, in this modern data architecture, like beyond what we've already talked about? Okay, so yeah, so let's, let's change track. Let's talk about something different. So what I wanna talk about is this whole era that we're living in is, called, is the era of decentralization. And 
so I want to uh, narrate something that actually Tim O'Reilly uh, originally came up with this whole uh, pendulum swinging all the time from one place to another place. When we started our journey in this modern architecture, we uh, actually not modern, uh, we are going back to modern is a very relative thing, but uh, Going back to 1950s, 60s, mainframe computers were the de facto standard. Everything was centralized into mainframe computers. But then as a computer usage went up, there was a move to decentralize hardware and we did it through personal computers, PCs, laptops, and so on. So now we went from centralized to decentralized. Then Microsoft Windows came and it it centralized everything back uh, in, at the operating system software level. Then the internet came and we decentralized it once again. But then the cloud providers and cloud data warehouses came and once again, we centralized it. So the pendulum has, has swung again and we now live in the decentralized space. So decentralized space, uh, we've already talked about internet has decentralized the hardware. Cloud has decentralized uh, how we access services. Microservices has decentralized uh, applications. Now we are seeing even in the data, decentralization is taking place through concepts like data mesh. Now data mesh is a business concept. It's not a technology concept, so we are still working through it. But the idea of data mesh is that, that we have decentralized our teams, made them domain driven, and we've decentralized how we build uh, our data for consumption through data as products. If I take it even a step further, I think we are only at the cusp of decentralization. One thing that has uh, caught the world's attention, especially venture capitalists, VCs, is Web3. Web3 is all about decentralized internet or decentralized apps. And what Web3 is saying is that, what is the biggest problem we have in, in, uh, in data world? It's trust. What if I could take my data product, put it on Web3, which is tamper-proof, cryptographically secured, and I now have a lineage of my, my uh, data product. So what I'm sharing with you is not a common view. It's something that, uh, that, uh, I, that I think may happen in the next three to five years, but but I'm going to stop here because I, I want to get your thoughts on what do you think about some of these decentralization ideas. Yeah, no, the the pendulum is a really good analogy. Like like so many of uh, Tim O'Reilly's other analogies, um, like like Web two, like Web two point um, yeah. But uh, yeah, you know the the decentralized concept because. Like you said, we did start to organize around the centralized cloud, uh, you know, putting everything into like an Amazon or Google or Microsoft cloud, um, and and that sort of centralized. But then there's once once that layer becomes commoditized, mm -hmm. it typically allows innovators to rely upon that as a foundation for a new layer. And that new layer it seems to have been a distributed layer on top of that cloud commodity. And uh, for a variety of reasons, and it seems to be uh, powered by this blockchain concept, which I think mm -hmm. is a little bit off topic uh, simply because it's like, okay, great. You know, Bitcoin is making a bunch of people money and everyone wants to be in on that. So, you know, yeah. what's what's the framework that we're going to build blockchain applications around? And I've seen so many ridiculous applications using yes. blockchain for things that just do not belong in a blockchain uh, and will just lead to complete and utter disaster. Yet at the same time, there's so much interest around it. You, you know what they say, uh, you know, first they ignore you, you know, then they mm -hmm. laugh at you. And then they fight you and then they win and then you win right so like I, I feel like we're in that same world with with this web three where there's so much nonsense there that you at first it's easy to just ignore or or laugh at <clears throat> and then 
but there's there's so much activity around it. They're 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 starting to identify a real you know they're starting to solve real problems with this technology, even if some of it seems to be ridiculous. So, uh, and there's so much of it. I definitely imagine that Web three will will take off in somewhere some way shape or form. I don't know yet what the killer app is. Yeah, and I think that's part of the problem is we haven't really you know seen that. Um, although I personally think that there might be something around uh, data personalization, uh, keeping your data distributed away from the marketing firms, away from the, the, the sales call, calling people. So somehow abstracting your data and keeping it decentralized, you know, maybe in your own browser or something, and then only sending it when you want to send it. Uh, but I don't know, we'll see. So yeah, do I think there's something there? I do. I just don't know exactly where that will be. Oh, so, one, one, one last thing I do want to say, and um, uh, actually, I'll let, I'll let you talk about it because I think we, you might, there's a question about this that we can talk about later um, around, uh, you know, the, the value of blockchain in this new world. Yeah. So, you know, I am actually surprised how many uh, companies I'm now talking to, product companies that actually have some sort of a blockchain uh, hidden underneath, and then they don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, there's a company called Vendia. Tim Tim Wagner, the father of serverless computing, the guy who created Lambda, created a company called uh, Vendia. Uh, they actually use a quantum ledger uh, as as their engine, but they don't want to to necessarily talk about it because they don't because people have views of blockchain and they, when they think blockchain, they think crypto and crypto. It's a very expensive, uh, in fact, it, it's such a resource hog that many countries have even banned it. Uh, you know, the amount of electricity used by, by just mining uh, crypto is same as amount of electricity used by all of Netherlands. You know, this is, so, the, so now the question comes, oh, why is Web3 then such a big deal if we are struggling with, with, with these topics? That is because, with the, the new way of, of how we're doing it, we are actually avoiding all this heavyweight processing. It, this is a concept called proof of stake. And proof of stake is still very new, but basically it's a lightweight, it's more of a trusted thing. We don't have to prove the trust. So it's actually not the blockchain we think of when we think of crypto. This is, this is uh, the new uh, way of thinking about it. And by the way, your thing about first, they laugh at you, they make fun of you. You know, this very recording, I we could take this recording and turn it into an NFT. <laughs> it is an NFT. All right. Uh, anybody in the audience, you want to buy the NFT for this recording, just put your price <laughs> in the uh, uh, Q&A window. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, right. Um, well, I, I, think, I think it just points out that there... There's so much interest, and it, they have solved a problem. And now, yeah. are they going to find other use cases for that technology? And I, I think they will. Um, and you know, one example I've talked about before is a friend of mine worked for a company where they transport uh, seeds from other countries. You know, mm -hmm. they import seeds from other countries to the United States, and the, and the difference between those seeds and other seeds is really in the DNA. You know the seeds grow slightly different they're more resistant to certain fungus or whatever and so um but somebody who's buying the seeds they want to know that the that that seed actually came from where it was uh they think it came from and so they they're creating this this uh just it's, it's a shared blockchain but it's not it's a ledger of some sort maybe it's the same type of ledger you're talking about where it's a proof of um, not work, but proof of what'd you call it? A proof of what? Proof of stake. Proof of stake. So it's a proof of stake that this person who is yeah. selling me the seed actually did have yeah. the right to that seed, right? Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I maybe that's, yeah. maybe we'll see it in like a, a distributed partnership type situation. Sure. Yeah. And, and just to clarify, I, I am not at all proposing that we put all our data on blockchain or quantum ledger. I'm, I'm talking about metadata, like information about that data, which is lightweight, you know, mm -hmm. so. Right, right. Um, 
Okay. So, by the way, talking about trends, so I, go ahead, because there's so many other trends we can talk about. We just got into this fun topic of Web3, but yeah, go ahead, uh, Dave. Yeah, well, what what other trends are um, you know do you see coming beyond uh, the Web three? Okay, so I you know there's uh, a shift happening. We've uh, typically been very focused on structured data, uh, doing some heavy duty coding on it, uh, batch uh, data. But now I see there's a lot of emphasis on uh, doing streaming data using semi structure, unstructured data. We talked about low code, no code. One thing that I, I, I want to, uh, to talk about is, is a lot of time our discussion becomes very focused on the analytical architecture, which is you take the data from operation systems and then you land it into S3 and then you do whatever transformation and uh, machine learning on top of that. So we forget that there's the whole operational side of the world. And that operational side is hugely uh, critical. That is actually the bread and butter of companies. This is how companies make money, you know, is through these operational databases. And uh, I could be down on my analytical database for a few seconds, minutes and recover. But I, if I'm down on my operational databases, of my business stops. So the trend that we are seeing is uh, the couple of trends and actually they oppose each other. One of them is specialized databases. For example, distributed SQL databases started by, to be honest, uh, Google Cloud Spanner. But now you see CockroachDB, Yugabyte, and there are a bunch of other ones. These are SQL databases that support SQL, most, more, all, all of them have Postgres SQL compatibility, but they are distributed in a way that they're not just multi-region or multi-availability uh, uh, zone, they're multi-cloud. I could today have a database where I don't care where my data is uh, getting served from. If I'm an EU, then I get data from my local machine from one cloud provider in the US, it's a different cloud provider. Not something for every use case. I'm not proposing that everybody should look into this, but we have the technology today. So this is on the operational side. The other thing that I'm also seeing is there's another school of thought, which says that if I'm doing heavy duty graph work, then go get a graph database, not a problem. Uh, but uh, the trend is to do multi-model or some call it multi-modal whatever uh, you say, uh, uh, you mean by that, but the idea is to converge the different data structures into a singular database. So this way I may have a relation database where I can do document database style JSON lookup, I can do graph, I can do time series, I can do a full text search. So uh, so some, some uh, vendors are saying, this is the way of future, some are saying, no, get specialized database. What should you pick really depends upon your use case. Right, yeah, and, and having worked at uh, Redis for four years, uh, you know, they're known as being a cache, but they've done the same thing. There's Correct. now, uh, if you wanna run any one of those types of uh, right. databases in memory, you can use a module to have um, all of your data in, in, in Redis and, and use it as a, a graph or JSON store, or whatever. Um, well, great. Well, in a matter uh, to just keep an eye on the time here, I know that we've got some questions that are related to some of these topics. So I want to make sure we hit them. Um, so one of the questions is, you know, what are the trends you're seeing within individual stack components, such as ingestion, transformation, and BI? <clears throat> and the next topic we were going to talk about is, you know, the common tools and stacks. So okay. uh, why, don't, why don't we um, address that? What are, what are some yeah. of the common tools and stacks and some trends that you're seeing around them? Right. I, and by the way, to answer some of those questions, I, in some ways I've been answering them, like, you know, streaming uh, data for ingestion is a, a thing. For transformation, it is doing transformation in, uh, uh, in, 
inner layer above and then doing a push down into the execution layer, you take that transformation and you can now version control it. Yet another data ops, DevOps thing, which we, we didn't really do that uh, very efficiently in the past, but if I'm doing an ETL or ELT transformation, I can now uh, put it on GitHub and I can uh, do version control. If something goes wrong, I can roll back. So, so just to, to answer some of those questions that have come up. Got it. Moving to this new uh, question. So uh, common tools and stacks. So, so the, the joke in the market is that today, at least in the US, we have five tools, uh, five stacks. Everything we do uh, is now revolving around the five stacks and they are AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, Snowflake and Databricks. So these are becoming so big that uh, you know they are sort of subsuming uh, the entire uh, operations around it. And so, uh, but but along with these uh, stacks, the tools are coming in in many different uh, places. We talked about some of them. Uh, for example, data observability is a very interesting space. We see a lot of companies talk about data observability. The, some of the big ones I see are Axel Data, Big Eye, and uh, Monte Carlo. So they are basically saying that uh, as our stacks or as our end-to-end -end pipelines become very complex, how do you know that something isn't broken? How can you proactively find what is going on in that space? So that is uh, a, a very common set of tools uh, that have only recently emerged. Another common set of tools that have emerged are in how do you do data access governance? So here we see companies like Okera, Immuta, Privacera, uh, which is basically uh, simplifying the way we create policies. Uh, in fact, uh, even cloud providers have it. AWS has something called lake formation, but that's for AWS only. So we see the, the common tools are starting to, uh, to emerge in specific areas. So I've got one question here. I just want to uh, go ahead and answer now, which is um, there's a question about a user who is a public library and they're using on-premise Cloud Era and Hortonworks clusters, but uh, they have budget constraints and so they can't use them anymore. Uh, so they're looking to migrate to a new cluster. And, and, you know, given what we know about mm -hmm. the changes that are occurring, um, do you know of any stacks that they might move to that would help them in, with these challenges? So the first question is if they are going to move, uh, so they have two choices. They can do private cloud or public cloud. Uh, which one they should do really uh, there is, I, I wouldn't, my first reaction was pick a cloud where you have the skills uh, maybe you've got you know Microsoft Teams and uh, Microsoft Office 365. So Azure may be a good choice because you already have Power BI skills. I, I'm just using that as an example. So so my first thinking was pick your your cloud provider and then you can move into uh, Azure has HD Insight, uh, Google has Data Proc, and AWS as um, EMR. But then I stopped myself because if you are cost constrained, you know, how do we know the cost will remain the same or, or go up? So you can also look at, you know, on-premises like Cloudera, for instance, has Cloudera private cloud, uh, which uses more modern technologies. And uh, I would say you literally have to do a proof of concept and see, what is the nature of your workload and where is it going to be most cost effective to run? Right, so maybe they can store their data in a um, object store type scenario, yeah. keeping their costs down. Yes. Uh, and then, and then you know, take a look at open source Cloudera or Hortonworks or uh, perhaps uh, uh, Spark, um, you know, yeah. uh, it could also be an option for them. And, um, but keeping the data in the object store and then keeping yeah. your, 
clusters smaller might be a good alternative for them. Okay, we, we're running out of time here, and I don't want to uh, I don't want to cut a couple things short. So, mm -hmm. um, what about um, uh, how do you, how do you evaluate the components of a modern data architecture? So, so one of the uh, the uh, point is is about deployment. Uh, so, so that was a great question because that is exactly uh, when you if we just talked about evaluation. Uh, so, so check to see you know uh, if you're uh, you may be in a situation where you may say that if I have to run my my batch job nightly batch jobs or I have to to hydrate my data warehouse uh, that's that's a continuous process so I'm going to keep that on prem but when I have to train my machine learning models and I need a thousand GPUs I don't have thousand GPUs sitting spare on premises I'm going to use the cloud so cloud is fantastic when you have ephemeral use cases you want to scale up scale down very fast and stop paying for it so that is one evaluation for your deployment is dependent upon the nature of your use case. The yeah, second are, evaluation oh, keep, criteria. Keep going, but we are going to be running out of time here. Okay. Soon, so. so the second evaluation criteria is uh, skill sets. We've already talked about it. Another one that I I want to uh, highly uh, emphasize is customer experience. That customer experience could be developer experience, could be end user experience. But the problem that we are, that I constantly run into is where organizations have accumulated a lot of technology like a, a, a data governance, data catalog, but it's shelfware. Why? Because it is so hard, it's not intuitive to use. So make sure that whatever tool or technology you pick can be easily adopted by the intended users. Um, okay, good. Well, we are almost out of time here. So let's get to the last question, which is how, how do you future-proof your architecture? Okay, good point. So there are many ways of doing it. Uh, you know, uh, dep again, depending upon your use case, if you're Netflix or Capital One and you're all into AWS, that's fantastic. But if you're a smaller company and uh, you're not sure where to go, which uh, uh, cloud provider to pick, then picking a vendor neutral third-party product that's multi-cloud or hybrid multi-cloud might be a good idea. And I mentioned some of them already uh, in my my talk track. So this way, you don't ha you're not locked into a certain stack or technology provider. The other uh, option is some people like open source, and they think open source is super important for them. We know open source as a business model has struggled, but PostgreSQL I mentioned a few times, you know, is, is might be a good idea because now you're not locked in, so you you've kind of future proofed your architecture. The third thing is is uh, look for uh, for cloud native deployments. Cloud native, by the way, also means private cloud on prem. So these are uh, products that run in containers orchestrated by Kubernetes, because as long as I have a Kubernetes uh, engine, I'm, I can, uh, I have the portability. The last thing I wanna talk about is uh, when you are future proofing, look at whether you want an integrated or best of breed. If you go for integrated solutions, then you will be locked in. However, uh, it's faster. You don't have to worry about identity access management, logging. Uh, you have a single throat to choke if something goes wrong. But if you want to future-proof yourself, uh, th then you may look for best of breed. With best of breed, the onus is on you to do the integration but now you are not locked into a, a particular technology. Okay, so um, I know we're really short on time here. I just want to get a couple questions and then we got to wrap it up because we're actually sure. over. Uh, but a couple questions, one from, uh, how do you view the database deployments in a DevOps pipeline in terms of configuration uh, product migrations? Hmm. Um, you know, it, that's a real challenge. So, I mean, any, any suggestions there? So uh, uh, database deployments in DevOps environments should all be done through infrastructure as a code, IAC, where you actually have a Kubernetes operator and you have a YAML file 
in the YAML file, you define your configuration and, uh, and instead of hard coding the configuration into your database deployment, you actually do it in a file. File is get, put on GitHub, you have revisions of that and you can quickly roll back, go back and forth and do it on different platforms. Okay, and then um, one last question, which is um, kind of a, one of the main themes, I guess, is do you think the emergence of a cloud data warehouse would pose a threat to a traditional data warehouse vendor? A hundred percent. A traditional, there, there is no such thing as traditional data warehouse vendors. You know, Teradata had its own uh, issues with pricing and, uh, but now the Teradata Vantage, they're in the cloud. And by the way, they have the same maturity of the product. They can do a join with 40 tables in a blink of an eye. But all the emphasis is, is in the cloud. Well, great. And uh, with that, I think we are about done, or we should be done. <laughs> um, and we answered our questions. So we're, uh, we're gonna, we don't have to answer any more questions. So thank you very much, Sanjeev. Very and I do want to point out that um, that you know this type of information is going to be we are going to continue to discuss these topics. We are planning to organize an unconference uh, in late March or early April, and we haven't set the date yet, so I don't have anywhere to point you to right now. But we are just calling it a modern data architecture camp, which is another term for unconference. And uh, since you've registered for this event, we will send you an email to let you know when that event is scheduled. And really that will be an opportunity for us to have more people come and join us and, and have a, a broader discussion about more topics and each topic can get its own breakout session. So you'll be able to ask and get answers to more questions. So uh, again, thank you very much. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you, Sanjeev, and I uh, look forward to um, doing more of these with you. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much to Dave and Sanjeev for their time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. We hope you're able to join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. <laughs>